Okay, so good morning for those joining in the UK and this part of the world. Good, good afternoon if you're in Pondicherry. Good evening if you're in Phnom Penh. Uh, welcome to this uh, fourth lecture uh, of this year's uh, research seminar series organized by the Southeast Asian Art Academic Program and the Center of Southeast Asian Studies at SOAS. Um, we welcome Professor Dominic Goodall to speak to us uh, today and his title really challenges us to consider why do we know so little about the goddess and her worship amongst the ancient Khmers. A few words about Dominic. He's a Sanskritist and historian of religion who's been a member of the FEO since 2000. He became head of the Pondicherry Center of the FEO in 2002, where he remained until April 2011. He was then posted in Paris from 2011 to 2015, where he gave lectures at the École Pratique des Hautes Etudes, the religious sciences section, principally on Cambodian inscriptions in Sanskrit and on the history of Shaivism from unpublished sources. He's now once again posted in Pondicherry, where he continues to pursue his scholarly interests, in particular in Sanskrit poetry and in the history of the Shaiva Siddhanta. Among his publications are editions and translations of works of poetry in Sanskrit and of hitherto unpublished Shaiva scriptures and theological commentaries. He is currently a professor at the FAO, co-editor with Dr. Marion Rastelli of the Viennese Dictionary of Tantric Terminology, the Tantrika Bidana Kosha. He currently participates in two ERC projects, Shiva Dharma and Dharma. And in May 2016, he was elected the corresponding member of the Academy of Inscriptions and Literature in Paris. A few words here about, uh, about the lecture today uh, in Dominic's words. All of us start with misconceptions about Khmer inscriptions, about what Khmer inscriptions and art can tell us. And most find ourselves asking, why is it so hard to marry iconographic and epigraphic data? There are many partial answers. Often we have lost crucial parts of epigraphs or misinterpret what survives. The inscriptions were of course, in any case, not written to inform subsequent generations of strangers about religious ideas and practices, nor to describe and explain the installations they record. So historians are trying to establish answers to their questions by eavesdropping on a discourse that is really about something else. Furthermore, most of the statuary has also been lost, melted down for precious metals or damaged beyond legibility. And in any case, unlike churches, Hindu iconography doesn't necessarily say much about the sect orientation of its temples. Of course, we can turn to prescriptive Sanskrit texts surviving elsewhere that lay down how images should look and how they are to be worshiped. But what has been published of such literature is mostly South Indian and post 12th century, describing notions, practices, and iconography specific to the Tamil speaking South of the Chola and post Chola periods. And some deities such as the goddess and Skanda, although ubiquitous in sculpture, painting and literature, do not seem to have surviving corpora of first millennium prescriptive literature governing their worship anyway. Each of these issues could be explored in a separate lecture and goddess in Cambodia is already a huge topic in itself. This lecture will focus on a small handful of objects that elucidate a tiny part of that topic and its difficulties. And without further ado, I'd like to welcome Dominic um, Dominic, the screen is yours. Thank you very much indeed for that uh, full introduction. And uh, thank you very much in the first place for inviting me to this series of lectures. I think of myself uh, as indeed a historian of Indian religions and uh, studying Cambodian documents is always uh, a hobby, which gives me enormous pleasure. Um, but uh, I have to confess that uh, I chose this topic partly because I thought that is something I would really like to have thought more about. <laughs> and therefore, this is not a very polished uh, assessment of the entirety of the question. There may be many little pieces of information that I have forgotten to mention or not stumbled upon. Uh, I rather started to think about this uh, in recently. Um, so I was going to start, I say, I, one way of dealing with such an enormous topic uh, is to start with objects, which is what I said I would do. And one of the objects is the one you see in the photograph there. It's um, a photograph, sorry. It's a photograph uh, taken by Claude Jack, uh, recently deceased, of an inscription. Uh, first of all, um, 
I thought that I would start uh, after, in fact, many of the questions I asked, uh, or the main question I have already, in fact, in effect answered <laughs> in that summary, uh, but uh, it remains to illustrate some of these points. But I, I recently stumbled across uh, this rather fine uh, summary of uh, the issue of goddesses uh, in um, Bruno D'Agenes' book, Les Khmer. And so I've given a short translation, missing out little bits here and there. Cambodia did not see the developments in the worship of the goddess that are observable in India from the 13th century. So this is a, a point worth making. Uh, Indian religious history uh, races on beyond uh, a period when uh, it marches in tandem with what is happening in Cambodia, in Indonesia, in other parts of the Sanskritic world. And indeed, what I think uh, uh, Dajans is thinking of there is, for example, that there isn't, uh, that we do not find evidence of shark the tantra, that's to say goddess-based uh, tantra worship uh, in uh, Cambodia. So there are a lot of developments that took place after even the 12th, which do not seem to be matched. We have seen that goddesses often reduced to the role of consorts are often difficult to recognize. Omar Parvati and Sri Lakshmi can be identified by their headdresses, which reproduce those of Shiva and Vishnu. Exceptions are Pragya Paramita, so a Buddhist deity, recognizable by her quatrua, and Durga, she who kills the buffalo demon, Mahishasura Maddini. Curiously, these statues seem to disappear from the beginning of the Angkorian period, while inscriptions commemorating their installations multiply. Among other independent Brahmanical goddesses, only Saraswati and Ganga seem to have enjoyed a certain popularity, even if no images of them have been identified. So there he touches on an important point. Uh, it's very, and there are so many images that we seem to have mentioned that we cannot identify among the statues that survive. Um, in my lecture, I haven't really said anything about river goddesses. Uh, I feel that they're a class apart. Saraswati uh, is maybe an exception because she is both a river goddess and a goddess of learning. And then he finally adds, there remains the paradoxical case of the series of seven or eight mothers, Matrika, who by the way are usually called Matri in Sanskrit sources. Uh, these mothers totally absent from epigraphy are represented twice or perhaps three times, all three from the 10th century. And then he observes, um, this seems an interesting point, the violent character of the mothers could explain their lack of success. So uh, he, what he suggests there is that somehow uh, among the Khmers, there was no taste for uh, uh, blood, bloody, frightening goddesses, as we clearly see in many parts of the Indian subcontinent. Whether this is true or whether we are simply missing the evidence, we don't know. Um, when I, sorry, one more slightly boring phase of text. Um, when I uh, was invited to give this lecture, I was asked to give a biography, but I misread the email uh, and thought it was a bibliography, which is why you might have seen a bibliography on the website. And the bibliography, like all bibliographies, is full of terrible lacunae and such. So I then came up with this other bibliography, which again misses out many, many important uh, publications. But for what it's worth, the first uh, work in the, of Bhattacharya is, of course, the first major work on uh, Indian religions in Cambodia. Uh, the second, uh, an article by my own guru, Alexis Sanderson, which, is, as uh, many will know, is a book-length study, really, about Shaivism, but many, many things are touched on. Um, Bihani Sadkar's book on heroic Shaktism. This is a relatively recent book on the cult of Durga in ancient Indian kingship. Um, the next one uh, mentions uh, in the introduction uh, some history of the worship of the goddess Gauri, uh, the pale one. And then uh, my colleague Shala Schmidt has written many important articles about uh, the Vaishnava background of uh, Durga. We often associate the goddess uh, with Shiva, but um, she has shown, among other things, that there is a palpable Vaishnava background. And I think this you will see how this is relevant.
A few other things, uh, Anna Schlatzka's article on the iconographical chapters from the Devyamata and the Art of Bengal. I mention that because um, we look at art historical books, which all of them have been very much influenced, I think, by in Indian art history, by uh, um, the work of Rao, uh, iconography of Hindu deities, or I forget what it's called, in two volumes. And that in turn depends very much on South Indian texts. Um, and here, um, I think that uh, with uh, this, um, with this uh, publication, Anna Schatzka has furnished us with uh, some published, some, some early uh, non-South Indian uh, scriptural teachings about uh, Hindu iconography. Also very important, Yuko Yokochi's various articles, I just quoted one there. I think that uh, her contribution to the study of goddesses is also very large and important. Uh, she shows uh, through um, large mytholo mythology, but also iconography, how complex the uh, case of the mul multiple goddesses who are in some mythologies, uh, in some mythological accounts being fused with one another and others somehow distinguished. And uh, I think that um, what her uh, very clear uh, and extremely uh, erudite articles are very precious uh, for illuminating this subject. Okay, uh, a map. Uh, this is just to say that the first object um, is really south of Phnom Penh. Uh, so I, we're down here in the river delta. It's right where I have this 35, so that's more or less where it is. Um, so this inscription that I'm going to look at first is a very interesting case. And you might at first think it is already published. It's published in uh, uh, the Nouvelle Inscription du Cambodge of Savaras Boud. But uh, she has published only one side of the document. So we only have the uh, Khmer text, but the thing actually has two sides. And uh, you can see, uh, sorry, many of you may not read French, but one of the, what she assumes from this is that there is a, uh, a lady of high status, Tang An, she's designated by, who uh, she thinks uh, has installed an, a statue of Chandakarkaini and a statue of Mahaganapati. And she speculates in that first note under her commentary on the right hand side, she speculates that this Chandakarkaini, it could be uh, a name of Durga or it could be in, the name of Durga, which is Karkaini, plus the name of Shiva. And you could imagine, therefore, that it could be a, an, an, a couple enlaced, a couple embracing each other. So there are various uh, suppositions she has about uh, this uh, situation. But, uh, and now let me show you what it looks like in the establishments that we have from today. Uh, the, on the left-hand side, you can see uh, a recent establish, uh and you can see uh, on the right-hand side, uh, the Sanskrit side, the left-hand side, the Khmer side of this document. Um, in fact, when we look at older establishments, you can see how much damage there has been. But you also see something that provides, I think, a clue that could have told uh, um, the editor, had she been able to see it, that this was not an image uh, of Shiva and uh, Durga of Karthiyani. And the clue um, is the, at the summit. Do you see that uh, on the left-hand side, uh, the thing the emblem has been worn away, and I don't know whether you can at once recognize what that emblem is. Uh, the one on the right, I think you can see, uh, I tell you, that it is a chakra, that's to say, it's a discus, which is one of the weapons we usually associate with Vishnu. And on the left, therefore, you can probably now see that, that uh, sitting on a lotus blossom, stylized lotus blossom, there is the other of the emblems that we often associate with Vishnu, namely the conch. Uh, yes, so here you see them a little bit larger. Um, and you can see that when these photographs were taken many years ago by Claude Jack, the, the uh, emblem of the conch was still largely visible. Since then, uh, the stone has been, has suffered, has been broken in two. 
Um, but curiously, uh, the, the state of the stone now allows one really to read the first Sanskrit stanza with greater ease, I would say, than was possible before. So uh, now uh, I reveal what it, this inscription starts with uh, a verse, uh, it's a Sanskrit verse inscription. As you know, all the inscriptions in Cambodia that are in Sanskrit, with very few exceptions, are in verse. And it seems to say, Chandakatyayani Devi Sthapita Yagyadayana Durga Dinnena Sayatra Kaverum Palyatam Purim. So what I think this might mean is the goddess Chandakatyayani has been installed by Durga Dinna, the patron of this religious act, in a place where she may protect the town Kaveru. So this is very exciting uh, for various reasons. We have a new, brand new toponym, Kaveru, which seems not to be a Sanskrit toponym. It seems to be belong to some other language. We have the name of the theonym, Chandakarkayani, the, the, the name of the goddess, and Chandakarkayani. Karkayani is a well-established uh, name of Durga. Chandakarkayani means Fierce Karpiani. We have also the name of the sponsor, who is not, in fact, a woman. His name is also quite interesting, Durgadinna. Uh, this is not a regular Sanskrit name. And I think that, sorry about the noise here. Just uh, close that window for a second. Uh, Durga Dinna looks as though it may be formed out of a, uh, it may be a partly Prakrit name. So uh, there isn't very much uh, evidence that has been widely discussed of Prakrits in Cambodia, other than, of course, Pali, which is one of the Prakrits. But this name Durga Dinna looks to me like it may be a different sort of Prakrit. <laughs> And that makes it an interesting name. It looks like it means one given by Dinna, but the, uh, given by Durga. Uh, but there are plenty of doubts, of course. I'm not very certain if it's reading Pali uh, Tham at the end, which in any case uh, would be grammatically a little bit odd here. But it seems to be evidence of a fierce goddess who is by herself. And in the Sanskrit text, we have no mention of birth. Uh, Maha Ganapati, as we have in the Khmer text, who sounds therefore as though he must be a sort of accompanying figure, uh, not a principal deity, but a subsidiary one. And uh, so it seems to be evidence of a lone standing, relatively fierce goddess who is uh, tasked with protecting a town. And uh, until now, I don't think we had such clear evidence of this category of goddess in the Khmer corpus. Um, only a couple of other Karpianis seem to be mentioned in the Khmer epigraphical record. So one is uh, pre Angkorian, K56. Another uh, is not really normally visible in the published record because it's in uh, the inscription of uh, a certain Yagyavaraha, the man who produced the Bante Stray Temple. And, um, but it's one of these inscriptions which has not been fully published. So the line in question is not uh, legible and therefore this one may slip through the net if you search through the published corpus. Um, Durga, by the way, is also rather a rare name. And this is something I will, uh, in, in the corpus of inscriptions and that's something I'll come back to. But we do find Chandakarkayani in Nepal and the purpose of this page on the right is to indicate that this is a page from uh, Bihani Salkar's book, which I was mentioning. It's a, a, mess, a, a page in which he speaks about uh, a, a Nepalese manuscript, uh, sorry, a text surviving in Nepalese manuscripts discovered by Divaka Acharya, which refers uh, to uh, Chandakarpyaini as a lady who obviously commands sleep and uh, her mantra is quoted there. So Chandakarpyaini finds parallel in, um, in Nepalese material or in material that survives at any, at any rate in Nepal. Yes, going, coming back to the emblems of conch and uh, discus, Shankar and Chakra, which we associate with Vishnu, 
In fact, we should really, at this early period, be associating them with uh, the goddess also. And uh, this is a case that could have been adduced if, uh, to just give that support, because this is a list of uh, uh, servants or slaves given to a goddess. And uh, at the top, on either side of this uh, pre anchorian stella, we see, again, uh, disc and uh, conch. In fact, in this case, uh, the, the, the waters were a bit muddied by uh, Louis Fino, who in this paragraph explains how uh, there are two donors mentioned on either, both on the two faces. One is somebody called Charlagrama Swami, and the other is Aditya Swami. And uh, Charlagrama, he says, is the name for, for this shell. This, and, it, and so on his side, we have a conch, <laughs> And on the other side, Aditya Swami is the name of the sun, and so we see a sun. But this is really not correct. Um, the Shalagrama is rather this kind of object. It's a fossilized ammonite, uh, which becomes the aniconic icon of uh, Vishnu, uh, and comes really from only a very small area uh, above a certain village called Shalagrama in Nepal and then spread right across the Indic world. And many people choose to worship Vishnu in the form of the Shalagrama. Uh, what we have instead is in fact a conch and a uh, discus. And if one looks here to Nepal, for example, but if one looks to contemporary inscriptions in other part, parts of the Sanskrit world, you can find that topping, putting at the top of a stella uh, some representation of a conch and a chakra uh, is quite common. A, in Nepal, it gradually starts to get replaced by a bull, uh, a, a bull uh, sitting down, which we also find, by the way, in Cambodian inscriptions. So I think that uh, there's really no doubt uh, these images, this K66, this inscription also has a conch and uh, discus. And Aditya Swami and Shalagrama Swami, that's a, a red herring. Uh, yes, nice and clear here. Yes, as I was saying, we associate these emblems with Vishnu, but uh, there are plenty of goddess sculptures uh, early on also, which reveal that uh, they should be associated with the goddess also. As I mentioned, uh, the contribution of my colleague Charlotte Schmidt has been to show how deeply imbricated in the Vaishnava pantheon the goddess was at an early period in India. And I think we find evidence of the same in Cambodia. So uh, I say in Cambodia, I mean in the uh, world, in the Khmer world, because here what I'm showing you is uh, an image that was found from the bank of the Barai below Bat Phum, so in, uh, in Laos. Yes, uh, you can see that it has been labeled Lakshmi, and I have put uh, uh, quotation marks around that because one of the things I wanted to highlight is uh, how very labile, how slippery and changeable these names, particularly of goddesses are, how difficult it is to say what kind of goddess we have here. Of course, we could say that this is Lakshmi because she seems to be a spouse of Vishnu if you think that the emblems of conch and discus are very distinctively Vaishnava and therefore show that she is very closely related to Vishnu, so closely that she is a spouse. But um, we also find images uh, with, of the goddess with these emblems when she seems to be uh, less of a spouse and more a terrifying independent lady. Uh, here, this is from the National Museum of Cambodia, and I don't do this to criticize anybody here, I just indicate how, it, how the statue is labeled, which is, illustrates another slight problem. I think that we often see what we think we see. Uh, so this is described as Durga laying low the demon buffalo, but uh, I think you will agree there is no visible buffalo. However, there are many images from the south of India uh, which show exactly this form. Durga with a variable number of arms, uh, here eight, 
and she is standing on a buffalo's head. So this is a, a particularly magnificent uh, example from a temple called Pullamangi. And I'm meant to put in the reference to the article, a uh, long article by Charlotte Schmidt and Vijayven Gopal about uh, Pullamangi, but forgot. It's in the uh, bulletin of the Ethereum. Um, so what you can see here is indeed the buffalo is represented by the buffalo's head. Um, and you can see a whole lot of weapons in there. But I hope you can also see that two of those weapons on either side of her headdress are a sort of winged discus and a winged conch. And this is on a Shaiva temple. So on the north side of Shaiva temples in the Tamil-speaking south, we see regularly the goddess who, because she is on a Shaiva temple, is felt to be associated now very firmly with Shiva. But she still bears these emblems of uh, Vishnu, the discus and the conch, uh, among her other arms. Uh, as for the quotation, I put that there because uh, it's from a text called the Kirna Tantra. This is a text I've been working on for many years. So this is a very early Shaiva Tantra, and it contains a chapter all about iconography. And so this should in a way be the holy grail for uh, art historians because it gives you all kinds of early labels and uh, uh, specifications about iconography, which you would think would then be helpful for looking at the wide body of imagery produced after the Kirna. Kirna, I think, dates to about the eighth century. Uh, um, but you can see that uh, it's not so simple, really. <laughs> because, uh, well, for one thing, uh, the label used here is Chandika, which is maybe not what we would expect. We would expect something like Durga or Mahishasa or Mardini. Chandika is usually used for even more fierce forms. But you can see that the text says she, one should make Chandika beautiful with eight arms, having breasts, holding shield, sword, bow, arrow, Quite, that's to say, chakra and conch and trident. And by an amazing coincidence, I feel <laughs> uh, all of those emblems are there uh, visible. But you see that she's then described as standing on the lion, bearing ornaments, slightly angry, that is not so visible, and crushing a buffalo. Well, she is crushing a buffalo's head. Uh, the buffalo, it, it looks more like an allusion to the myth than the myth itself represented. The lion is on her left. And uh, here you can see that they're in the panels to the left and right. We have the lion, uh, and then we, on the right, we have a gazelle being held by a little gunner. And that's because in the Tamil South, there is a poetic tradition in Tamil, which shows a fierce goddess, usually called Kotruve, who doesn't have as her vehicle the lion, as we find in North India, but has instead the gazelle. And here, and in several other South Indian sculptures, we find the two combined. And below those uh, vehicles, we find two people cutting off different parts of their body as offerings to the goddess. So even if we didn't think, can't see from her face that she is angry, and even if we see that she is extremely svelte and beautifully shaped, uh, we can tell from this that she is in fact a rather fierce lady. Um, Yes, yeah, so this was just to illustrate how the Kirana is a very old text. Uh, the oldest manuscript already dates to 924 of the Common Era. The oldest manuscript survived and survives still in the Kathmandu, Kathmandu Valley. And so it's in the National Archives of Kathmandu. And this is uh, one of the folios in question uh, with the description of iconographical matter. Um, yes, yeah, so uh, the I wanted to show you that briefly. Um, there are plenty of other temples of this type where we have on the northern face, always facing uh, outwards on the northern side of the Shaiva temple, we have this image. And some people call this type of image Vishnu Durga. You can see her beautifully dressed on different days, dressed differently. This is the Shiva temple in Punjay. You might not be able to see the conch in the disc, but if we come a little bit closer, uh, well, you can see that on the hand that is on our right, uh, when the garment is a little bit to one side, you can see that there is in fact coming up uh, a sort of between scissor shaped fingers, a conch. And on the other side, we see the uh, blade edge of the uh, 
discus in one way or the other, parallel hand. Yes, so for many people, uh, this is the spouse of Shiva. Uh, and this is an easy uh, conclusion to come to in a way, because, so what I'm showing you here is the five rings of the entourage of Sadashiva, according to various tantric texts. Uh, and in this, the, the, the ring which has two names in red is the, the, the sort of holy family that's to say, it contains Nandin and Mahakala, the two watchmen of Shiva, and uh, a dancing figure called Bhingin, then two sons, Skanda and Ganesha, the bull, uh, sorry, I have written, uh, written it in French, Toho, the bull, and then we have these other two figures, Devi and Chandisha. The reason why I put them in red is because they are the only two figures whom you regularly see on South Indian temples. And this uh, illustrates, for me, uh, well, for different people, it illustrates different things. I think some people say that a South Indian Shaiva temple is a kind of expression in stone of what you uh, find in the Agamas, that's to say, the Tantras, which teach us how to worship Shiva. For me, I think it's rather the reverse. What we find is that uh, the figures uh, that are arranged around the South Indian temple, uh, they have, have a totally independent tradition uh, the temple does not very clearly or very well express uh, the theology of the mantra manga of the Shaiva Siddhanta, which it, it, where even though most of these temples today are uh, temples which claim adherence to the system of rules for worship taught in texts of the Shaiva Siddhanta. So uh, this is the way things are usually arranged on a South Indian temple. At the bottom, you have the entrance and two doorkeepers, Dvarapala. In the middle, you have the sanctuary. On either side, uh, around the linga, which is in the middle, you have uh, Dakshinamulti, a south-facing form of Shiva, and Brahma on the right. You very often have a representation they call Lingodbhava, which shows Shiva emerging from a linga as a column of fire. And then uh, we find Durga, on the northern side, as I mentioned, and Vignesha or Ganesha on the southern side. Uh, so this is very typical uh, configuration. And here, just one more example. Uh, again, the goddess uh, and the Brahma above the spout, which leads the offerings away from the linga. Um, just briefly, uh, in fact, uh, South Indian temples very often have a goddess shrine uh, on the northern side of the temple. So in this plan that I'm showing you, you can see that the thing in the middle is the Shiva temple and Shiva is mentioned there in the middle. And then uh, you might be able to see that in the other large shrine, which uh, opens towards the south, uh, we have Amman, that's the Tamil name for the goddess. And uh, she is therefore to the north of the main shrine. And so, um, this uh, feeling that the spouse of Shiva is on, on the northern side, the Brahma side, which is a well-established convention in Sanskrit literature, but the, the, the left or northern side of somebody, of a man, is where the spouse stands. And, uh, and, but in fact, these uh, shrines to the goddess have typically been added relatively late in the 12th century. Uh, and from then onwards, it becomes a constant feature in. Uh, South Indian architecture, a goddess shrine placed to the north of the entryway, uh, opening onto the entryway and facing, opening south. Um, and I think it's very easy then to conflate and say, okay, well, this spouse goddess is the same as the goddess who faces north and is on the shrine. But uh, really, she's not like a spouse at all. As you saw, she looks, uh, she is alone, she is beautiful, she is at the same time fierce and a warrior, and she is not very spouse-like. Um, this is just to mention one case where we have a, a Pallava, let's say, a much earlier instance, and not uh, on the northern face of a Shaiva shrine, showing that the tradition really predates that convention, in fact. Again, she has, uh, looks like, eight arms, and again, uh, prominent are the discus and the conch. Okay, so well, that was uh, what I wanted to say about uh, Chandakarpyani, and I see the time is now racing by. Um, 
I was now going to show you another kind of uh, image, uh, another kind of object, that's to say not an inscribed image. It's something which I call an aniconic icon. I think I'm not the only person to use this expression. So aniconic icons, I think we are all familiar with them really. Uh, it's what in Sanskrit would be called an avyaktalinga. So in Sanskrit, uh, we distinguish between, many texts distinguish between a linga, which is vyakta, that's to say, it's an emblem of God, but it's vyakta, fully manifest. And that is a way of referring to a full sculpture. And a linga, which is avyakta, and that is what Shiva's linga is. So in Shiva's linga, uh, popular art leads you to suggest that you might see all kinds of different things in the linga. According to the Mantra Marga, you are supposed to see uh, a ten-armed figure called Sadashiva. In fact, the Sadashiva is extremely rarely represented. As you may know, the majority of inscriptions uh, of the ancient period in Cambodia that survive, probably the majority, are inscriptions that, as the principal information, record the installation of a linga, by which people tend to mean this kind of linga. Um, but according to the Shaiva Siddhanta, what you see in it is uh, this Sadashiva figure. So I think you can already see that this is, uh, makes uh, some kinds of identification uh, of sect specificity rather difficult. We cannot uh, see, uh, we can, when we worship, we can visualize Sadashiva with 10 arms, but what we actually see is this linga. And I think historically there's been considerable development about what is visualized in a linga. Um, in uh, Vatpu, uh, which is where this next object I'm going to show you comes from, uh, we find evidence, very clear evidence, that uh, for a sizable period of time, uh, the uh, image there, the linga there, was regarded as being uh, a Shaiva Siddhanta, the shrine was a, a, a shrine of the Shaiva Siddhanta. So this image from beside the shrine shows the ten-armed Sadashiva in a sort of ling Godbhava moment. That's to say, he's like a column, and on either side of him are Brahma and Vishnu, uh, the two other principal gods venerating him. Brahma recognizable by his four faces, and uh, Vishnu, again, the conch and the disc. Um, on the other side, we see this object, which very much intrigued me. Uh, so um, it's here in amongst a clutter of uh, uh, old stones. Uh, I don't know whether you can see it's on the ground there, uh, hardly visible. Uh, this is a close-up view. Um, it's what it looks like is five small balls. And um, uh, sorry, I'll just show you this a little bit more clearly. Five small balls on a pedestal with a runnel with a uh, spout for letting offerings poured onto it, uh, pour off. Um, and it so happens that there are a few passages in Sanskrit literature which speak about a thing called the Panchavritta or Panchapinda or Panchapindi. And uh, so I'm not going to go into them in great detail, but here is one of these passages, not particularly early, I think, which describes a religious observance for the worship of Gauri. Gauri being typically the pale spouse of Shiva, that's to say the goddess as, uh, as wife of Shiva. And it's explained uh, how you perform an observance where you eat particular, uh, uh, you fast, you wear red garments in honor of the goddess, you uh, keep yourself calm and so forth, and then you worship uh, Gauri. And you can worship Gauri in an image made of gold or one of wax or sandalwood or, and so forth. Or alternatively, you can use a panchavritta. Uh, panchavritta, and then there's a little piece of commentary on that. Panchavritta, panchapindamayi ityadhe. The expression panchavritta means made of five balls. Panchapindamayi. Okay, so here's another passage uh, which is doing the same thing. It's from uh, a, a Purana, the Agni Purana not particularly early text again. And here we seem to learn that Gauri can be worshiped in a Panchapinda, uh, which is somehow her avyakta form. Uh, and uh, it, there seems to be labels for each of the five of the balls, Lalita, Subhaga, Gauri, Kshobhani. Uh, and uh, yes, 
I'm afraid uh, that the text should, I think it's got corrupt there, it should say Shakti is the fifth. In any case, uh, in addition to those, uh, we seem to have found what may be the source of this, a doctoral student working here in Pondicherry, Sushmita Das, is now working on an edition of a chapter of the Brihat Kalotra, which is a text of the Mantra Marga, where we find again this Panchapin being taught, and I'm not going to give you that passage. Uh, but just there it is on uh, folios, again an old Nepalese Palmyk manuscript attesting to the antiquity of that text. So also in Laos, in this time in the museum in Vatpu, there are a number of other objects that look like they might be the same. So uh, they're labeled in the museum as Panchalinga, and indeed who is to say whether they are Panchalinga or not, it's difficult to tell. Um, but I think that they might really be Panchapindi. Here's another one which is in the reserve in the Vatpu Museum, uh, rather oddly shaped. And uh, in the British Museum, they have a few uh, of such objects. So these are little from Maharashtra from the 18th century, apparently. You can see uh, a linga on a pedestal and over the linga is the five, uh, is the naga, which you find very commonly, of course, in Cambodia. In front of the linga is the bull. Uh, and uh, to the one side is what I believe is meant to be the aniconic icon of the goddess. Namely, uh, instead of a linga, she has five balls heaped up together, like a little heap of cannonballs. Um, a friend of mine sent me this image, which is from cave number 19 in Udayagiri. Uh, well, I can't examine it, but I think that this is another instance of the same thing, the five uh, balls, undateable, of course, but uh, Udayagiri is a very ancient site. I don't know what one it might date from. Okay, so a uh, second object to illustrate uh, the kind of thing that could very easily escape many people's notice. Uh, and uh, these, I think that we should look out for more of these in the future. I think that this is a punch of bindi uh, <laughs> uh, representing the goddess, but in an aniconic form. Um, I was going to say a few things maybe about uh, other goddesses. Uh, again, what I was really going to talk about was how slippery um, and difficult the names are. So this is in Prasad Karan, which many of you may have seen. This is a, in low relief uh, carved into the brick of the walls uh, of the uh, northern tower, of a, of a northern tower, is our representations of a goddess. And uh, conventionally, they're called Sri or Lakshmi because the inscription on the door jam tells us that this is a shrine to Sri. But this doesn't really look like any Lakshmi I have seen, according to the emblems held. She has here what seems to be a trident, and she has a discus again. And then I'm not sure is that an axe? I don't know. And then another emblem I cannot identify in her lower left hand. So. Um, uh, what we would expect seeing uh, Lakshmi, at least on the Indian subcontinent, would be much, perhaps something more like this. It's very common to uh, indicate clearly this is a Lakshmi by putting on either side two elephants, two elephants who are uh, pouring over the contents of two pots that they hold over Lakshmi. So it's Lakshmi being inundated, being uh, bathed with water poured by elephants from two pots. So there she is uh, receiving these, and you can see beneath her are lotus leaves, ladies offering things to her, and she is holding in her, and this is again normal, you can see that she is holding a lotus. I'm not sure whether she's holding two lotuses. Very often she holds two lotuses. Uh, so that's what we would expect uh, for a Lakshmi. Um, just to illustrate again from the Kirana, you remember the Kirana is this early text of the Mantra Marga I showed you earlier. Uh, how labile and messy all the naming conventions are. Here we have uh, the Kirna's description of Saraswati, which I have checked in several manuscripts. <laughs> and here Saraswati is there holding a veena, this musical instrument, with lotuses in her hands. So she must have uh, enough hands to do both those things. And uh, she is with, with a well-nourished body, ornamented and so forth, and being bathed from pots held up by the trunks of a pair of elephants. 
So once again, I, well, in this case, I feel that Kirna lets us down badly in the sense that it gives us an expectation that we will see uh, a goddess called Sarasati holding a vina and being bathed by elephants. This is something I have never seen. So some of these uh, uh, iconographical texts seem to be a part of a priestly literature, which is not actually very much help in identifying images. I, th I mean, I cannot ha help having the suspicion that whoever wrote this uh, simply hadn't ever paid attention enough <laughs> to some of the images that were being described. I mean, this may be, may be quite wrong. Uh, of course, it's also possible that the text has got corrupt. But I say all of this partly because I think some people have a kind of mm, rose-tinted spectacle view of the prescriptive literature, and they think that if we could only find the authentic uh, prescriptions in early Sanskrit texts, then many mysteries of iconography would be cleared up. But it is my impression after trying to find these things that the prescriptive literature more often than not, is very interesting in its own right, but doesn't actually illuminate very much uh, the iconography that we find, particularly in early centuries. Yes, um, so what are the things we do not find in Cambodia very much? Uh, so these fierce goddesses, uh, Dajans alluded to this in the summary that I referred to earlier. Uh, so in many parts of South India, particularly uh, East the Bengal, Bengal and the East, and uh, to some extent Tamil Nadu, we find a lot of very fierce ladies who are goddesses. And here's one uh, often called Chamunda, but there again we have a whole range of possible names, Chandi, Chan, uh, Chandika, uh, and, and many, many more. Uh, if you look at the, the, the works that I've referred to, Tifani Sanka, Yuko Yokochi, uh, Shala Chwit, you'll see quite a range of possible names. And um, here she is described by uh, the Kirna, and she belongs to a set of the Saptamatri, that's to say the seven mothers. In Tamil Nadu, they're often called seven virgins of the Kanya because they're never shown with children. Uh, and um, this is something that is very rare in Cambodia. So Dajans alluded to that. Here we find uh, plenty of instances in uh, South India. Uh, this is just part of a sequence difficult to get them all in. And uh, just to show you rather different conventions are possible for representing the fiercest of them, there's charm and In fact, there's one sequence that uh, Dajans was not, I think, aware of uh, in his list of 10th century. Uh, representations in Cambodia. So here, I think that this must be such a sequence. We have, uh, uh, and other people have suggested this too. Brahmi uh, uh, is usually the first in the sequence and we find her here to the right of the door of the uh, southeast tower of the Quinkunx at the top of the Prem temple. And if you go around, you can see if the regular order is followed, then you can identify all these ladies. In fact, the only two who seem to be distinctive iconographically are Brahmi, which I've shown you there on the left, because if you look closely, she has four heads, like Brahma. And uh, Varahi, who has a sort of beak there, it looks like, but it's meant to be a boar's snout. So again, this is something that is a bit mysterious. Uh, why are there so few of representations of the Saptamatri in uh, Cambodia? And why are they uh, so uh, con concentrated in the 10th century? Whereas in uh, the Indian subcontinent, we find them from pretty much the length and breadth of the subcontinent, and we find them in very early periods. Uh, but we do not find very much interesting textual material about them, I would say. I mean, that's to say, what we find doesn't seems to be relatively late when it confirms a number of seven or eight. Uh, the earlier material is very, very confusing, very uh, varied, very various lists of names. Um, yes, and one of those towers on the top of Prerup, as we know from one of from the enormous great Prerup inscription, is a uh, tower uh, that is dedicated to Gauri. Uh, so uh, the, the Quincunx uh, clearly contained uh, five icons. The central one must have been the Linga called Rajendra Bhadreshwara. 
and then there was clearly at least one Gauri, at least one Shauri, and at least one other Ishwara as perhaps statues. And then probably there were four images of these three deities. So in other words, one of those deities must have been doubled, probably Shiva. So presumably uh, these uh, goddesses are placed on the southeast tower because uh, that was the tower in which Gauri was installed. And on the other towers, you see male deities. Yes, uh, very often it's a kind of rule of thumb. If you see a uh, female uh, Dwara Palika, that's to say a doorkeeper, then you expect to see, uh, then the shrine probably contained the goddess. A male Dwara Palika, much more could be said about these, but I'm going quickly. Uh, usually the shrine contains a male deity. Another person, uh, personage who is entirely missing is uh, Pali and uh, the fierce goddess. At least we don't know whether she's entirely missing, but she's missing from, uh, you might have expected to see many more if this were another comparable region of the Indian subcontinent. Um, though there are, in fact, uh, and I'm afraid I don't have time to speak about this image at all, there are, of course, fierce goddesses here and there, this one in the National Museum in Cambodia in different stages of uh, repair. Uh, uh, but, uh, well, there's a story about that. We do not see many other deities, so this just to illustrate one. Uh, Jeshtha is a deity you find very often in the South Tamil countryside, particularly in the early period. And uh, she is somebody not really explained by Sanskrit literature of contemporary, of con contemporary Sanskrit literature. You can search in vain, it seems, uh, for explanations of who this lady is. Uh, and again, we don't find her in Cambodia, but in this case, we don't find her anywhere else, at least not recognizably, in the Indian subcontinent. She seems to be unique to the Tamil speaking south, but also on the kinds of sites like this great Kailasanath temple, which are associated with royal patronage and with Sanskritic learning. Uh, okay, one other thing which I don't think we see, and this is something that we might have been led to expect from. Uh, Bihani Sokar's study, which emphasizes this very strong link between uh, the, the, the martial, between military activity and the goddess. I cannot see that there is any evidence particularly of this in Cambodia. In other words, we would expect, might expect to see that kings in particular, and in connection in particular with military campaigns, might have installed images of the goddess because the goddess is a warlike goddess and she assists uh, military persons. So the one possible exception to this, I, 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 it occurred to me, might be uh, this inscription. I don't know what you might think, those of you who are interested in the Sanskrit interpretation. Uh, the third verse there is, is there interpreted by Sedes, who connects uh, the installation by Bhavavalman of this goddess with uh, um, an installation accompanied by rites which are suitable, uh, fitting for the goddess. Uh, and this is translating Devi Yatarta Charitaihi. Well, the Sanskrit of every verse of this needs correction for interpretation. It's uh, tricky to know what is really meant, but it just occurred to me that it's conceivable that what was meant was instead that uh, Bhavavarman managed to install this image on the basis of, in other words, using the funds acquired through his acts, Charitaihi, which were somehow in conformity with the Tata, with uh, the goddess. In other words, they were part of, they were military acts uh, conforming to the ethos which the worship of the goddess uh, belongs to. Okay, and I think that I'm now at the conclusion. Uh, yes, so um, I, I really need to wrap up here. Uh, one of the things, there are many things that I haven't touched on. What I hope I have managed to do is to illustrate to you uh, that the literary resources are extremely sparse. Many epigraphs have not been read. There's still many things we could find out from new discoveries. Uh, the icon, icons are extremely difficult to identify, not simply because uh, they're not labeled, and that's the point I was about to come to with this slide, but also because um, much of the early literature that tells us and tells our historians how we label gods and goddesses seems really not to have applied in an early period. And uh, 
in addition to that, one could mention that it's extremely rare to find instances where we have both a statue surviving and the epigraph that purports to describe that statue, or not describe that statue, but refer to its installation. And so, uh, although we can say that there seem to be these and those trends missing, I think that we, we must bear in mind that we, we have a lot of the information is missing or very difficult to interpret. And so one doesn't stumble on things like the punch of Bindi uh, unless one is looking out for them. And it's difficult to look out for them because one doesn't expect them to be there. Uh, this list is not a comprehensive list. It doesn't pretend to be. This is simply what I drew up while trying to prepare this lecture, a little um, um, aid uh, memoir for myself. Uh, it was trying to illustrate one basic difference, which I think Dajas pointed up, uh, that in the pre-Angkorian period, we seem to have a lot of uh, deities who might be Durgas, Karpiaini, and so forth, and uh, solitary ladies, uh, and specifically associated with Vishnu. In the Angkorian period, we don't seem to have so many independent deities, and, and yet we have an increase in numbers of allusions to installations. So let me just draw attention to the differences here. On the right are the Angkorian period inscriptions, and you can see that a very large number of these ladies are called simply Devi, which confounds any attempt at identifying them when there are no further precisions. But in many cases, uh, we have the further information that they are with Vishnu or they are with Shambhu. And then we know that they're really essentially spouse deities. And all of these instances, as I've written in blue at the bottom there, are instances of a goddess installed along with other images. So that is very uh, st striking in the uh, Angkorian period. Pre-Angkorian period, uh, quite a different uh, 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 set, uh, uh, um, a different uh, kettle of fish. Uh, we have some named deities. We have a number of them alone. So there's ones, the four that I've listed at the bottom, these seem to be ladies who are by themselves. See, um, one of them, 56, probably she's by herself because it's an inscription that mentions many different foundations, but they seem in each case to be associated with different cities or towns. And um, uh, in some cases, I would say that the information that the lady is Ekebhoga with other genitives. So the very first one I mentioned there, we have Bhagini Murarehi, which means sister of Vishnu. But the fact that she is mentioned as Eka Bhoga with different other divinities means that she, uh, the offerings made to her, are uh, the revenue that is collected on behalf of that goddess, the sister of Vishnu, is shared with other deities. And that to me uh, rather suggests that she too is somehow an independent goddess. She is a goddess in her own right. I think that if she was simply a spouse goddess, uh, or there simply because she's the sister of Vishnu and she's next to Vishnu, if that were the case, we wouldn't specify, there would be no need to specify that her income, her revenue is shared with other deities. So um, to conclude, uh, I leave you with this bibliographical slide, but to conclude, I think, I hope that I have illustrated for you a number of the ways in which um, the, uh, uh, the identification of these deities is extremely difficult. And I think we're very much at, uh, uh, in, uh, there is much, much more that could be done to try and elucidate uh, the history of goddess worship in uh, Cambodia. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Dominic. Thank you so much for that incredibly rich um, lecture. I hope you are okay yourself because you had to close your window and you've got no electricity, so. Yes. I might just open the window again. If Please you don't do. Mind. I would like. I don't want to think of you suffering lack of oxygen. <laughs> um, now, I'd just like to remind uh, the participants uh, that there is a Q and A box that you can enter uh, text into to type your your questions. We already have two questions there, but before we move on to that. Um, I'd like to hand over to my colleague Soka, Soka Siang, who's a third year PhD student at, uh, at SOAS, uh, researching uh, a topic, Angkorean administration of the ninth and 10th centuries, a study of aristocrats and their temples uh, to, to, to um, manage this next section, the Q and A section. Soka, please, the screen is yours. 
Okay, thank you, Heidi. Uh, thank you very much, Dominic, for such an interesting presentation on the subject of goddess and her uh, worshiping in ancient Cambodia. Uh, while we are waiting for uh, people to write down their question, let me make a general remark on textual resource to kickstart the uh, Q&A session. Uh, in Cambodia, unlike in India, local manuscripts of various religious and non-religious practices do not survive until today. And from the inscription, we have learned that various books were imported into ancient Cambodia. They were kept in place, we now call library at various temples. Those books were copied, perhaps recopied over time during at least the pre or an ongoing period. They even have a place for when they are expired. Uh, the reason they do not survive until today will probably be due to um, the material that they were made of, which could not last a long time, unlike the stone inscription we found at various Khmer temple. Moreover, it might also be related to the chain of religion from Hinduism and Mahayana. Buddhism to today, Theravada Buddhism, which as a result make those manuscripts not relevant to Cambodia from the 15th century, which since has adopted a new religious ideology. Uh, from inscription, both Sanskrit and Khmer, we have learned of various names of books, various religious practices, even state class supposedly imported from India. Uh, of course, the presence of the term can at least allow us to assume that various books and practice from India were used in Cambodia or, or at least known among the elite. But it is much more difficult to know the practical use, for example, of the religious practice in ancient Cambodia just merely from the presence alone in the inscription. We probably can't assume that the practice in Cambodia is a mere image as that in India. Uh, otherwise, we might fall into what uh, my first director of my museum, George Courier, prov provocatively called friend colonial scholar in the early 20th century for studying Cambodia as if it was a part of India, the Hindu propagandist. And we we also see others who seem to make Hindu religious aspect less important in seeing Cambodia past, such as the work of Bikri, who focus more on socio-economical aspect. The approach to study ancient Cambodia by relying, of course, on the source in Cambodia and also on the source from the outside uh, is, is, is not only difficult, but sometimes could also Kind of draw criticism. Uh, all right, that's all for my remark. I think we we have many questions. So let's start with: uh, Is the myth of my goddess Naki Soma influenced by the synthesis between the Hindu devotion of Durga and the devotion of local goddess? For example, Ina or Naga. Um, yes, I can see that many questions are coming, which I have no idea how to answer. Uh, I think this particular one is, uh, uh, of course, the theme of a Nagini, that's to say a female snake person who marries uh, a Brahmin or person coming from India is, is not isolated. I believe that there are a number of other instances in different regions that came under Sanskritic influence. And um, that is something that, um, I don't know that there's any influence of Durga specifically uh, in that myth. It's a, it's a myth that it recurs. I mean, it's not, it's not an isolated case. I think among the uh, South Indian dynasties, you find it also. I, I think that uh, Emmanuel Francis in his book may have written about that and various other people. But uh, so my answer to that would be probably not. Um, but maybe I could just say something about Etik and Emic. Uh, of course, I very much uh, respect and, uh, 
other different approaches and uh, what Michael Vickery has contributed uh, to Khmer scholarship is, is of course marvelous. A uh, very, very stimulating book indeed on pre-Angkorian uh, uh, inscriptions and what they mean about what we can deduce from them about the state. I think that uh, uh, to that I would only say I don't really have a position where I'm trying to use Sanskrit sources and impose uh, on Cambodia the vision of it being a state uh, like all the other regions of India. Uh, I'm simply contributing, trying to contribute uh, pieces of uh, data that I am able to comment on uh, as a Sanskritist, having never lived in Cambodia before. So, um, uh, and I think that there is a lot of material, even if, I mean, without falling into either of those extreme ideological camps of the people who wish to see it one way or the other, to the exclusion of all uh, other possibilities, I think that one can see that there is a lot of material that Sanskritists can contribute by studying the inscriptions carefully, ideally with an open mind to uh, all the features which are specific to Cambodia. But this particular one, uh, the Nagini theme, is not actually as specific as you might imagine it. As I say, it has parallels in other parts of the Indic world. Okay, thank you. So let's move to the next question. This is uh, a bit long. Uh, I will just read it out. At the late of the 13th century, uh, Chandi Singh, I'm not familiar with the name, Chandi Singh Gosai, Temple in East Java, there are statues of Durga, Ganesha, and Agastya. At the temple site, were also found a retinue statue of uh, Kamunda and Pavati, all, const all constructed during the period of King Krikanagara, who followed esoteric practice. Is it correct to associate these three Sakti with the king who saw himself as both Shiva? and Buddha and was depict, depicted as Agastya. This is one of the very few known Kamunda in existence from East Java. Yes, well, I don't know about that kind of question. It's very difficult to tell. Of course, one always wants to find very specific interpretations of certain iconographical programs. At least uh, Durga, Ganesha, Agastya, this, this is very common sort of set no, in, in uh, in Indonesia, Augusta very often on the south side of the monument. And uh, so it's tricky to try and do this, but, but honestly, the answer is that I do not know. I didn't know that uh, Charmondo was so rare. Uh, I thought that there were more, but, uh, but I, so I'm sorry that I cannot answer that question. It's a very interesting and learned question. I do not know the answer. Okay, let's let's start with another question. Do female yajamana is available in India? Uh, yes, certainly. I mean, if you mean by that, uh, ladies who install images or create temples, yes. Uh, is it more common in Cambodia than in the Indian subcontinent? I have no idea. Uh, as you know, the the data is unmasterable. I mean, that's to say, there's large quantities of inscriptions, many of them unpublished. Even the ones in the published one cannot see them all, lots of languages. I do not know statistically, uh, but yes, there are such uh, figures. Thank you. Uh, the next question is, is the name Vishnu Durga attested in text or inscription, uh, or is it a designation created by art historian? Well, I suspect that it's uh, not attested. I mean, I haven't found it, and uh, I tend to put inverted commas around it. And I think people use it differently. Um, for some people, it means any image of uh, Durga with Shankar and Chakra. And it's the fact that the Shankar and Chakra which is, are there that has led people to use this label. Some people, it specifically designates the form that I showed you from the uh, National Museum, where uh, instead of being on a buffalo's head, there is simply some neutral open lotus or other other pindika, other uh, pedestal uh, and the shankar and chakra. So I think the label is used differently. You sometimes see it painted on temple walls above the, uh, as an identifying label, modern identifying label above certain images. I don't think I've ever seen it in Sanskrit text, but maybe yeah. somebody else has. Uh, we have another question. Uh... The late 7th century Durga image from Samlan 
you know the price. Uh, do you consider this a Durga or a Lakshmi? Are they identified Durga? Worry about that I, uh, who only hold a cons or a dish in Cambodia at this period, like in Mahabali Puram. Well, I do. Well, the, the, there's a catch in this word identifiable. Um, I don't, I mean, the image that I showed from the National, one of the images I showed from the National Museum in uh, Cambodia, in Phnom Penh, shows a figure who is a goddess standing not on a buffalo's head and holding just conch and disc, said to be seventh century, but this, and it's labeled as a Durga, but I don't know whether it's a Durga. Is it identical? Well, I don't know. And I'm afraid I don't remember this image from some land, uh, but maybe we could, you could show it to me and uh, we could correspond about it. And uh, I see also that my uh, guru, Alexis Sanderson, has written a question, mm. uh, or rather more an observation, critically hard to count, very problematic. Um, yes, a very ingenious uh, emendation. I will think about it. <laughs> Thank you. Would you like to answer that the question? Uh, well, I, uh, I, I don't think I can answer it exactly. I mean, uh, so the Panchapindi, uh, yes, the treatment of this in the Brihad uh, it doesn't surprise me that uh, Alexis Sanders is familiar with it already. I think he first drew my attention to this chapter. Um, but uh, the physical examples, well, I hope that they are examples of the Panchapindi. I think in the case of the Maharashtrian objects, that's what they are. Uh, in the case of the objects from the several objects from that pool, I still feel quite uncertain, but it, at least it looks like a, a working hypothesis. And maybe if other people yourselves are now aware of this possibility that Panchapindi is a thing, uh, five cannonball-like things, uh, then maybe we will start to find more such images from uh, other places in uh, Southeast Asia. I see that we have skipped a question from uh, Uta Hurskan. Uh, winged chakra and winged shalka. Yes, I don't really know about this. I mean, it's simply something that starts to uh, enter in South India in I think the ninth century, but I, I, one would really like to check all the images and see at what point in fact this, this trend occurs. It's something that creeps in. And unfortunately, because I do not know so many other areas of uh, uh, the territory, uh, of the possible territory for, for images of goddesses and gods, it's difficult to know whether this occurs outside uh, the, the Tamil speaking South. Almost certainly somebody here in the audience will know an answer to that question, but I, I do not know myself. It is a little bit like this kritika, this, uh, sorry, this, this uh, scissor uh, way of holding emblems, which uh, appears in the ninth century. Again, in specifically, it seems in the Tamil speaking South, uh, it's simply a, a kind of convention that emerges, putting wings on uh, certain emblems. Okay, uh, we have another question. A Padman Adventure Temple show a Shiva Nataraja with a small figure beneath, which has been identified as Karaika Amaya, the emaciated female devotee of Shiva mentioned in medieval communities. This looked like the one of the figure depicted below the South Indian statue of Jantika that you show in your presentation. Do you have anything to say about the transmission of this motif from South India to the Khmer woman? Yes, so uh, this is indeed what I had been intending to speak about with reference to uh, this, uh, both with reference to Chandika and with reference to another image I showed from the National Museum of Cambodia which shows a fierce form of the goddess seated on an owl. But it's in fact something that has been uh, elucidated by a colleague of mine, Eric Bourdonneau, and I'm not sure where he has written it up, but uh, I think that he has uh, really definitively shown, uh, and I think it's published, but uh, in any case, he has spoken to me about it. It is definitively shown that this is not Karai Kalamaya, 
So for a long time, uh, this was printed in a lot of secondary literature. The idea that Kale Kala Maya is shown in Cambodia. But um, uh, Eric Bourdonneau has made exactly the observation that you have made and has provided further proofs. And because I cannot remember exactly where he has written it up, uh, I, 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 and I didn't have the time to search. I cannot find it, but you could uh, ask him. In any case, I think one of the proofs is, and this is visible in the image of the lady seated on an owl in the National Museum. Uh, she is holding a human head. And in some other cases, you can see a miniature human body in her palm or dangling from her ears. Uh, all of this shows that this is not a human saint, Kale Kalamriya, but some goddess of massive superhuman stature. Who is, uh, uh, and uh, the notion that this is Kale Kalamriya, well, very romantic, would be a link between Tamil literature and Southeast Asia, uh, of the kind that one doesn't expect to find and therefore very exciting. It seems to be a completely exploded myth now, although it appears in many publications. Uh, yeah, the other question, why do you think the popularity of God that's worshipping has been smaller and smaller in the later centuries? Um, well, that's, uh, it's a very interesting question. I mean, I think that what it's what Dajan I think in the last words that I quoted from his book there about uh, the possibility that the worship of seven martyrs was linked to their being perceived as violent. Well, that may be the kernel of an answer. I mean, it may be that uh, there is less taste for uh, very fierce mother goddesses in among the Khmers. I think some of these things are a matter of taste. I think that we see, for instance, in Shaiba iconography, that there are certain regions of, of uh, the whole Sanskritic area where it's very popular to represent Shiva not only with lots of sanguinary attributes, but also ethyphallic with an erect penis. And there are other areas like in South India, for example, where you never, never see Shiva, a representation of any form of Shiva, it seems, with a, uh, an erect penis. Whereas in Bengal, you will see this even for such a mild and unsexualized form as Sadashiva. You can find Sadashiva with an erect phallus. So, in other words, it may be a question of taste. There are simply other religious tastes which are, are there and gradually develop. But every kind of possible response is there. I think one of the difficulties that we have for the, uh, is that there's a, a sort of imbalance in material. Uh, we do not, ha we have, there are certain periods which we really don't have very much evidence. And uh, for the Angkorian period, at least we can see that there really are a lot of goddesses, but they always seem to be, uh, uh, with other deities. And I think that that suggests that uh, indeed there is a sort of diminution of goddess worship, but it doesn't have to suggest it. It's, it's not clear. Uh, uh, the next question. Uh, to what extent does the distinction between material culture and textual source apply not just to Cambodia, but to iconography in South Asia more broadly? Uh, I okay. Yes, so this is something I had meant to say. Thank you for uh, pointing this out. I had meant to say that, uh, I think I started to say it, that there is indeed a big uh, dis uh, disconnect. Um, and uh, one of the reasons why I'm referring at all to Shiva tantric sources to describe, uh, to try and describe to show passages of, of, the, of iconographical description that relating to goddess who appears to be Vaishnava affiliated is that that's one of the earlier places where one can look because there are iconographical bits in these texts. Uh, why, why is there no uh, independent surviving uh, body of knowledge about goddess worship? Well, there, uh, uh, that, that dates from a comparably early period. I, it may be that it's lost. It may be that it was never actually produced. Uh, it, the, the different possible answers are there. I think one of the things that we see in South India, and it's something I wanted to suggest by the mention of the, uh, the goddess Jishtar and the mention of the seven Mahapuris, is that there seem to be traditions of worship which are very strong and vigorous among people and end up producing a lot of sculptures but they are not traditions which attract a kind of priestly culture. That's a, so a lot of what we have surviving, at least for the South Indian body of 
textual material, uh, looks as though it might have been produced with the concerns of a priestly class, a South Indian priest, uh, in mind. Sometimes it mentions also other caste communities or communities, uh, for instance, uh, the ladies who dance, or the musicians, or certain kinds of craftsmen. And one has the feeling that a lot of this literature is produced with very much with their, in order to ratify what they do, what they contribute to uh, large South Indian temples. If you have, however, a vigorous independent uh, goddess worship tradition where there is no need for uh, a priest uh, who is Brahmin and set apart from the rest of society uh, by his learning to uh, officiate, if it is a vigorous tradition where people go themselves, uh, or they might have a priest, but he's a priest who comes from another kind of community, not necessarily a very literary community, then uh, you might never generate uh, a body of prescriptive literature which explains why it is that Jeshta, for example, is flanked by a lady on one side and a man with a bull's head on the other side. And this is something for which we do not find, as far as I'm aware, explanation in any Sanskrit text. So we have a large number, hundreds, of representations from 7th, 8th, 9th, 10th centuries of this Jeshta lady very often with these two figures on either side, almost always. And we can see certain attributes, we can read them, the crow is there and a broom, as though she's swept. Uh, but um, as far as I'm aware, no work, no line of early Sanskrit prescriptive literature which tells us how to produce it. So part of the disjunct that we see in Cambodia to answer your question between material culture and textual sources is exactly the same disjunct in uh, uh, four different areas of India, same problem. Okay, seems like uh, we don't have an uh, other question. I have a question, actually. Uh, your, your, your friend Schmidt uh, seemed to associate Durga Mahisa Sura Madini with uh, 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 Vaisnavism rather than Saivasism. What, what are you saying about uh, the Durgamha, Mahisa, Sura, Madini in Cambodia? Well, I think, uh, I think that her observation is absolutely spot on. Uh, I think that if you start to look at early shrines in different parts of India, you can see that there is this association. Uh, so, for example, in the caves in Mahabalipuram, there is a very celebrated uh, high relief sculpture showing the goddess battling with uh, the demon, the buffalo demon, Mahishasara. And opposite her is another large, magnificent, highly relief sculpture of Vishnu lying on the cosmic serpent, Ananta. And uh, it's very clear, uh, and very, many people have pointed out, that, that cave, the cave in question has been redesigned in the Pallava period to be a Shaiva cave, but in origin it's a Vaishnava cave. But quite apart from that, there's the evidence of the emblems themselves, the uh, Shankha and Chakra, which I was showing, closely associated with the goddess in Cambodia also at an early period. And then this surviving uh, through the centuries in the Tamil speaking South, for example, as a kind of memory of this close association uh, with uh, Vishnu, even though more and more people begin to associate the goddess with Shiva. So I think that, um, uh, I think that uh, uh, Charlotte Schmidt's observations are very useful and explain why we have this Shankar and Chakra as a, a standard feature, part of the iconography of all these uh, warrior goddesses on the northern face of Shaiva temple in South India. In Cambodia, I don't know because I haven't seen nearly enough images, uh, Cambodian images to know, but I don't know how many images there are of later periods. I mean, as uh, Deja seems to observe, while we see lots of references in epigraphy to the continuing of insulation of deities, particularly female spouse deities. Uh, we don't seem to have that many images surviving. And maybe the, uh, uh, the last slide I showed seems to imply also that the representation of solitary deities, uh, particularly um, Mahishasra, Mahishasra, Durga is one such figure, uh, is rather uh, common, in, is not common, but is there in the pre-Angkorian period and not really evident uh, so much in the Angkorian. Uh, we have another question. 
uh, I wonder if uh, you might speak a bit more about what might be taken to be a sort of mirroring of social structure in the spousal and independent goddess. I'm thinking both about the respectively attendant character traits, supportive, beautiful, gentle, yes, uh, fierce, but also about the financial dimension you allude to, having independent revenue or not. The question is perhaps by thought in the context of what are often assumed to be different social structure between the subcontinent and Cambodia. Yes. Okay, so that's a very uh, rich and complicated question. Uh, I don't know whether I can say anything very intelligent about that. I think one thing that, and, and I have much more awareness of what happens in South India, as I, I think I said that um, uh, when you look at a plan of a South Indian temple, you can see that from the 12th, 13th century onwards, increasingly we get uh, the addition of uh, south facing northern positioned spouse shrines beside Shaiva temples. And indeed, the entire pantheon I showed you in one slide uh, uh, rings of uh, deities around Sadashiva, and all of those deities in some later texts acquire spouses. It's as though suddenly there's some kind of social pressure, which means that everybody has to be married, <laughs> and uh, which doesn't seem to be in evident or didn't act in the same way before certain periods. So clearly in South India, there is a very strong uh, pattern of um, marrying not just all sorts of people, but all the gods and goddesses seem to get married. But uh, in the case of the goddess, there's some very particular dynamic, which is uh, not just, a, a, which no doubt is partly social, but uh, there is a feeling that uh, the independent goddess, fierce, free uh, uh, lady, cannot be married because you cannot be fierce and free uh, if you are a woman. I mean, of course, it is possible uh, in uh, early society, but there are certain figures only who have certain freedom of property and uh, and we can see that uh, Rudra Ganikas, that's to say courtesans attached to the temple dancers are people who make donations, but and queens and widowed rich ladies. But on the whole, most women of a certain status are not so prominent, uh, except in these roles in uh, as do donors. It's, and uh, so um, I suppose that uh, a spouse female deity fits into the social fabric very naturally because women marry. Uh, of course, men do it too, but women, their, their whole world is defined by the husband who, or their father, who, some male figure who's inferior, at least, in, in, is supposed to control the decisions in their lives. And then, the, but then the, the, there are these fierce, free other women. And uh, so the goddess is somehow split into two. All the time, there are myths which explain how these two parts are related, they divide or they fuse. Uh, but I suppose that it must um, uh, it must be a reflection of this very strong tension in society. Uh, women are uh, controlled, married, but there is this uh, other possibility uh, there represented by the goddess. But I, I don't know. I, I have the feeling that somebody else who thinks about this more, like Bihani. Uh, Sarkar would be able to answer this question better, and I cannot answer the Cambodian side of things, but it does look uh, from the evidence that I quoted at the end, which is not, you know, not very carefully built together, but it does look as though in the Angkorian period, typically uh, the goddesses are spouses, rather like, so somehow seeming to mirror what happens in South India with, uh, this, with spouses all over the place attached to other deities. Dominic, thank you so much for that. I think this is a really good place to, to, to finish this question of women. And I'm sure as you suggested earlier on that uh, we, could, we could carry on with several more of these webinars, um, uh, unpacking all these different strands of thoughts and ideas. Um, 
I'd like to thank all, all our participants today for asking such great questions. Um, thank you, Dominic, again, for this incredibly rich lecture. And uh, thank you, Soka, for your response and for handling the questions. Um, thank you to my team, uh, Anna, and the team for putting this uh, lecture together today. Um, and before I go, um, I'd just like to remind you all that uh, on the 17th of March, we'll be holding our next uh, lecture at 11 a.m. Uh, Angkor Wat, Cambodia, A Transcultural History of Heritage by Michael Falser. So please don't forget to, uh, to, to register in advance. And if you're interested in seeing the recording of this lecture, uh, I've posted a, 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 a URL, uh, actually not in the Q&A box, in the chat box, but you can find it on the website, uh, the SOAS website, where you registered for this, for this lecture. So thank you one and all again, and hope to see you again soon. Goodbye. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Bye. Bye.